Okay. Okay, everybody. So, great talk. Nice and technical. Actually, went through a lot of those for sophisticated clients, so that was pretty good. That was a really good explanation. I've seen so many people struggle to explain it. Uh, it's, it's funny, but it's not. My name is Mitchell, Mitchell Raro, and I'm going to talk to you guys about the business side of blockchains and why they're interesting. So the tech stuff is obviously super cool, but I am not a developer, I'm not a coder. I'm not a cryptographer, I do business, I do marketing. So that's going to be the stuff that I focus on today. Business on the blockchain, how distributed ledgers will transform business models. First note, I use the word distributed ledgers, and that's because the blockchains is the first instantiation of a distributed ledger in the form that we now have, but it's not necessarily the only one. And there are similar tools that perform the same functions that aren't necessarily blockchains. For example, they don't only have one block. There's a, that's its own rabbit hole, but there's actually quite a diversity of systems. Firstly, if you guys want to know about me, I work full time in the space. I do nothing but crypto and blockchain. I did the audit. Okay, I did Ardor. I do marketing at Steemit. I do marketing at Sentiment. I am one of the founders of Blockchain Portugal. I do other stuff too. But who has even heard of any of these things before? Oh, some people. Okay, that's rare. I'm not interested in Steam. Oh, you're on Steam. You must be enjoying the recent activity. Uh, yeah, it's recent. That's <laughs> definitely recent. Okay. So we're going to stick to business model stuff, and I'm not, not going to go into a lot of the technicals because I don't think I can give you guys a very good explanation about that. So let's talk about what's a blockchain in one sentence. Share a database with a transparent rule set for incentives and determining truth about values recorded in that database. That's it. So we've got our big ledger, our big book of truth. We have our consensus mechanism, which is the only way that we can write into it. And then the values can be whatever we want, referring about to whatever we want. Now, Bitcoin is obviously the first, and its particular function is money. But if you can, if you think about it, there could be a lot of different applications for a blockchain, for this kind of ledger, a uh, source of truth that everybody trusts. You can do a lot of things with it. Okay, so why should we care? Because this combination of technologies, and that's what Bitcoin is, it's a combination of a lot of preceding work done over the years, makes trust transparent and efficient makes it cheap. So trust is very expensive. And if we can make trust cheap, it destroys a lot of the advantages that uh, have been held by centralized organizations and business models of all kinds. So let's talk about banking for a moment. How do you guys know, how can any of you know, like I'm obviously spoiling here, but do you guys have any way of figuring out how much money you have in the bank? So how do you know? Why do you trust your bank? It's like religion. <laughs> it is exactly like that. So for most banks, if they're not operating on paper, although if they're operating on paper, it's the same. They have a big database where they record all the numbers. But they don't let other people look into it. And then from time to time, they'll say, oh, you can enter your little key card or your code, and we'll tell you how much money you think you have. And that's a bank. <laughs> and uh, that's not bad. Banks are great. Right. But they have limitations. So how do we make sure that this is trustworthy, that this is benefits for society? We have harsh rules and regulations. Basically, we say, OK, you, we have to believe you that we have this money. But if we ever find out that you don't, we're going to do very bad things to you. We're going to throw you in jail. We're going to take away your money. We're going to you know, destroy your life. This is what we do. Uh, this goes for a lot of fields, of course, beyond <coughs> banking. But banking is just a good example. And of course, that doesn't work a lot of the time. So every I don't know, every once or twice a decade, something happens, and then something comes out that perhaps the banks or this other institution was not doing exactly what it promised to do. Uh, Portugal, no doubt you're all familiar with that. <laughs> now, blockchains are interesting because they take that same database, but they make the, the entire processes involved, basically every part of the system, they make it transparent. So we have these regulations in place, uh, and this, again, doesn't strictly apply to blind banks. So applies to pretty much any field. We have these regulations in place to ensure trust by creating incentives to act appropriately. Because there are bad things that happen if you don't. But with blockchain, we can build these, both these incentives and these processes into the system. And we don't have to trust anybody who can do it directly. The only thing we have to trust is that the system itself will work in the way that it is described. And this is where we get 
to the business models. We are essentially destroying a lot of the costs of these regulations, and the, we're destroying the cost of trust, and this creates opportunities for decentralized businesses, because all those institutions that made their money as being these gatekeepers of one kind or another are now perhaps not needed anymore. Cheap trust, decentralized opportunities. Oh, so I skipped some of the stuff there. I guess I left the slide in. Okay, what kind of opportunities? This is the fun part. <coughs> you get to decentralize the world for profit. It's great. Now, the last several centuries have favored centralization of all kinds. Uh, give banks are a great example. So banks, especially the fractional reserve system, are an amazing piece of social technology. They allow us to safeguard money in a way that we never could before. Say, you and I, we both have money and we want to make sure it's safe. We can't really trust each other, and we can't really trust each other to deal with it appropriately. But if we both trust the bank, the bank can take that money and they can use it more efficiently at net, even with the cost of trusting them. So banks are amazing because they are middle, because they focus on that particular function. And the world is filled with these middlemen of all kinds. Pretty much every possible business you can imagine, really. And blockchain say, well, why don't we take the function of these systems and we'll incorporate it into the network itself. So now you're not dealing with sets of middlemen that make up a complicated economic system. Now you're dealing with a single intermediary that is the network. So you have one channel instead of many, and it governs the entirety of the system. Here's the important part. By creating self-organizing networks with a scarce digital token, representing value on that network, you're able to transport the value from a middleman, the institution that's between, to the network and the users itself. And the rules regarding that are very flexible. You can integrate the processes of those systems into the rule set of the network, and you can incentivize its own growth. It becomes the only intermediary needed. So an example of this would be Bitcoin. How does it incentivize its own growth? Can anybody say? Yeah, but why would people use Bitcoin in the first place? Why would you want to do that? It's not your money. So, decentralized settlement, one of the most amazing innovations to come out of uh, blockchain in general. And it, it's going to absolutely transform all of your worlds and your children's worlds. It's going to be nothing like yours because we can, central, we can decentralize the settlement of value. And it's going to be insane how that turns out. And that's just one particular application. And of course, here we go, opportunities like Bitcoin. Value, aka money, is represented as tokens. There are rules for making settlements secure. It's blockchain and transparent. Mining will be value. Essentially, and this is, uh, you might have heard the statement that Bitcoin is the central bank of the internet, and it's absolutely true. You're like, you, but everybody gets to deal directly with the central bank, and the central bank can't deliberately screw anybody. It's great. <laughs> And because of the designs of Bitcoin at the central bank, it has competitive advantages against pretty much every other institution. It has no cost, and cooperation is built into its design. And of course, the consequences go way beyond Bitcoin, and they go way beyond banking. Like I said at the beginning, countless systems. Like it, it's impossible to describe the, the number of our systems that depend on the same processes. Money is just the obvious one, but they just go on and on and on. Trust is expensive everywhere. And that's why blockchains are interesting. We could be talking about all sorts of business applications, and at the end, we will, we will have those discussions, but uh, trust, it's all about trust at the end of the day. You get trust from transparency, and you get the efficiency thereby without having to deal with regulatory costs. Yes, consensus is a cost. Yes, consensus makes things slow. But does it make things you know, slower than, than traditional KYC or AML processes? KYC know your customer AML and money laundering costs, which are uh, laborious and expensive and absolutely needed. So that's just one example of regulation in every area in the blockchain process. And it kind of reflects this nascent sharing economy. Like, people talk about the sharing economy, and they think we have it now. We don't really have it now. But blockchains are going to bring it to us, and it's going to be incomparable in scope. 
But let's talk about a few of those businesses that are, are reflecting this growing sharing economy that's only going to be increasing as blockchains are going to accelerate. And these two businesses have made, of course, many billions merely by basically taking processes <coughs> and building a system around it and then providing value to all people thereby by, by taking the cost of that system and taking their cut of the middleman. We have, of course, Uber, which creates the processes, centralizes, and governs the processes for ride sharing of all kinds. Then we have Airbnb for houses. And of course, those are very marvelous businesses. Very, very healthy. <coughs> Blockchains could replace, well, before we, before we dive too much further, does anybody have any questions? Because I'm just kind of moving forward here fairly quickly. We want to know how to make money out of the blockchain. Oh, we'll, get there. <laughs> we'll get there. That's the reason why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if it's a good time to ask, but you'll tell me. Because um, he said in the beginning that the coins are used to play on the system, so to do stuff on sure. the system. But how is that really done? Like, Do I need Ethereum coins to build Ethereum, Ethereum apps? Is that how it works? Let's, let's, okay, for that kind of question, let's wait for the end, because it's really arbitrary, yeah. because Ethereum is just one system. Okay. Yeah. But we can talk about Ethereum okay. and okay. yeah, sure it towards the end, because yeah. it is a you know, very exciting project. Okay, blockchains could replace these how? Okay, let's take a good example that always really shines light about what we're talking about. Uber is just a system for government ride sharing. That's all it does has liabilities to make sure you don't get screwed over too badly, but you're allowed to get screwed a little bit. And it has fees that make sure everybody gets compensated according to something that is more or less fair. And as a result of the value that it provides, it's grown exponentially. It's a very, very nice business. But how could a blockchain kill something like that? Well, how would you like Uber, but without dealing with, with whatever the CEO's name is in future <laughs> and without paying any fees? Would that be an entertaining thought? No fees, no middlemen. Just you directly dealing with the person. You could even have reputation systems and some kind of legal safeguards in there. Those can be built into the rule sets themselves. You can program them into the blockchain. I say yes, please, because I want this very much. And I think a lot of other people do. We have projects working on that, like Arcade City, which is struggling. And then we have Swarm City, which is for the sharing economy generally. And there's going to be more and more and more. By putting the rules and processes for these business models, the network gets the value of the function. And guess who makes the network up? It's the participants. So we have a way of coordinating all our efforts at scale without, with, well, with marginal cost. And what costs there are distributed to the network, allowing us to dramatically lower our overhead. And we can do this by building the incentives into the rules themselves. For example, uh, if Satoshi wanted to create or maybe let's let's pick a few things in Ethereum. So Ethereum is actually a very very expensive network to run. It costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to keep it up on a daily basis. But because of the nature of the network, you can distribute the rewards and the cost to it. So who bears the cost of supporting the Ethereum cloud or the Ethereum network? Everyone. Everyone does. Not just miners who bear the energy cost. You and I in terms of transaction fees. And meanwhile, you know. You tell like Buthenin and, and Consensus and Co and the Ethereum Foundation in Switzerland, they're just sitting back, working hard, watching their head to appreciate, and uh, they, they do produce a lot of work there, but they don't have to do the work supporting the entire network. Whereas in contrast, something like, if we're going to pick something like Amazon Web Services, obviously not exactly comparable, but towards its own cloud, they have to support the entirety of that infrastructure. And if, well, not only that to support all the cost, but if something happens to it, they're, they're screwed and aren't incentives for anybody else to come along and fix it, whereas in these kinds of systems, build the incentives to make these systems very resilient into the rules or into the structures. How, how scared do you think they are? How scared is what? I don't know, just like regular big companies faced with this change. In well, it depends on which ones. Some of them love us. Uh, some of them fear us. Some of them, most of them don't know we're around yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it depends who you ask. Like. Um, Loads of banks were first uh, afraid of Bitcoin, but they now love blockchain because they know they don't have a choice anymore. <laughs> it's, that's why it's coming down, but your banks are all going off to the one way or another. They're still going to be around, but 
with something like a blockchain, you no longer need an intermediary to store your wealth. You can have a decentralized settlement of some kind or another. Um, the game. Private blockchain is like Ripple a threat to this? Uh, private, Ripple is not a threat to anything. But, uh, like, Ripple. <laughs> yeah, that's its, its own discussion. Private blockchains have utility, but far less than, than public blockchains. So an interesting thing that happens with public blockchain is you can take this, this business model of this structure. Whoa. What is that? I think maybe no power. So one of the things with, with one of these blockchains, you can make it for profit. And quite a few public blockchains are made for profit in one form or another, or blockchain related products. But what happens is if you create the, the incentive system properly, they can grow and grow and grow to the point that they become and behave like common goods. Mm -hmm. And over time, they kill the advantages that a private blockchain would have. Private blockchains have a, a fairly limited utility. I mean, you're just sharing the database among a select number of partners. But uh, why wouldn't you just put that on a public one if you're getting the same reach, scope, and privacy, and those things are coming to the public ledgers? Right? Except the public ones have far more security than the private ones who have security via not really being known or not allowing to list. So people are going to use them, and there's hype for private blockchains, but I, you know, a lot of us can just laugh at them. Uh, what is the motivation for the private blockchain? Because some banks and financial institutions think they can have blockchains and control it, which defeats the point. Yeah. But there, there are select use cases for that kind of service. Banks are actually a good example, because banks constantly screw each other over. And uh, basically, you need to trust all your fellow thieves to work together. I'm saying this is a guy against the fractional, so banking system is great. But you need to trust your, your fellow compatriots to work together, but everybody has an incentive to slightly screw each other, just not too much. So they're all messing around. And they all pay costs with that, too. So you could institute a private blockchain between certain banking partners to make transactions and, and passing data and information and value around extremely efficient. So there's a good example where, where something there is sent to the Another Another use case for a private blockchain would be, just say, we have weapons dealers, the factories that build weapons, the whole process of getting uh, the shipments of, of parts to build weapons and the clients could be something that we, nobody wants to be publicized yes. in a public blockchain. That's so the, the, the flow, the the industry flow is to be priced. Sure, you can apply that to any manufacturing or any kind of supply chain, and I'm sure something like that happens. Uh, but again, you're dealing, like the, the advantage of the blockchain is trust, so you're dealing with, in this case where people would like to trust each other, but they have a sense of strong enough that they don't really trust each other. So there is a benefit there, but if you could put that on a, a public ledger, it would probably be But like they get trusting each other, but not the people outside their circle. Good. I'm not they sure they 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 With a, a blockchain that only includes a group of people. Oh, yeah. Sure. They trust each other perfectly, but they don't trust anyone outside of that circle. So sure. They don't want anybody outside of that circle to see what's happening inside their circle. Yeah, it's like on our own keys. Exactly right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Basically, and the rule set makes everybody relatively honest. But, again, it, well, it, it's kind of its own thing. There are business applications for, 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 for private blockchains. But they are really limited. They are not to the degree that a lot of banks are excited for, as a lot of their innovation departments are beginning to learn. Sure. Um, on model agent simulation, it's quite well known, even on AI, that cooperation or being good citizen, uh, it's a good idea, but it will not happen. Even computers get aggressive on the long run. So you are relying on people cooperating with each other. And one of the things of the problems of Airbnb and trust is how we rate each other and how you can actually game the whole system and it's quite easy for instance i rate you and you rate me five stars and i go well and so the rating system fools the overall system yeah so my question is regarding to this because you're forgetting the part of how these systems are game and it's not necessarily bad and that it's going to be great because even ai at google uh if you know the computer after a few trials and run-ups got really good. 
with uh, overall agent model simulation, we have a tendency to overexploit on the long run. So the thing is, on these business models, how do you are going to set up some kind of a rule that don't let the overall network eat it inside out? Because most of the time, sure. this on trust is sure. I find that it's like it's um, it's Airbnb. I give you five, and I give you five. I go up. I have a higher score on my overall network. My authority is higher than the other, and yes. I, and I gamble the system quite easily. So that's. You understood very correctly that these are these are games. Essentially, all these models, when we're talking about incentive systems, we are designing games for people to play, for which we want an expected outcome. What you described there, in part, but not strictly, is, is the reputation problem. And that hasn't necessarily been solved. Say, one of my projects uh, with Sandpin, we're working on trying to deal with financial reputation, which is an extremely challenging uh, situation, because everybody has an incentive to cheat on financial reputation. To either seem like they know something or add more complicated than they are. So we have to design games and layers and games, layers of games, sets of games that interact with each other in order to offset this. And to some degree, we're just going to have to see how this turns out. It's not an unsolvable problem. These aren't necessarily unsolvable problems, but there's always kind of attack vectors that you have to deal with. So centralized, decentralized making the claim that the centralized is better, you have no scientific for thing that the centralized that it's No, it's a conditional good. It's conditional. So decentralized can be better depending on basically how the, the next system is structured. But there's lots of cases where centralized is better. For example, even if you're creating a, a decentralized system, you might want people to be legally liable, right, for what they do. So you still want that, that human factor in the game. It, but I mean, we're talking at such a high level here, we would have to zone in on a specific example to, to start applying these rules. Just because we're talking about making decentralized rule sets, I mean, you're not going to solve all the problems of getting people to cooperate fairly and appropriately just by, by putting it into the rules. People are going to try, and they have a very strong incentive to find a way to game. And it's your job as the community to, to safeguard that. So there's got to be some kind of vigilant function. The network has to secure itself in some way, and if it can't, it will lead to problems later on. Just because the network, in the end of the note, it's a person, and we all like to say it's otherwise a good citizen, but in the end, we're always trying to yes. find out how, namely for these people are trying to trick on the system yes. to not get. So blockchains are not transformative in the sense that they, they transform how we deal with each other. They result in basically gains of efficiency, because trust is becoming cheaper, not free. Is the difference. We still need to have some level of trust in the game or some level of policing <laughs> involved. And we definitely please each other. We definitely don't trust each other. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, so we talked about the rule sets. Oh, now I'm. Some examples uh, Bitcoin mining, of course, the original incentive model there. Miners get new Bitcoin for securing the network. And I'm going to touch on two examples that I work with that I help design them and create them as well. And these are these are going to be interesting examples because they don't rely on the blockchain in terms of its technical components necessarily, but they rely on what what kinds of they are business models that are made possible entirely by the blockchain. And that's the key that a lot of people don't necessarily get. Some people think that blockchains are going to revolutionize the world because they make, say, auditing super easy, like the fact that for following bad loans or zombie loans, or because they allow for various cybersecurity applications. And they're absolutely going to do that. There's no doubt about it. But the real innovation of the blockchain it doesn't have anything to do with the, the core technology, it has to do with decentralizing the rule sets, the processes, the systems themselves. Okay, that's the key, because that allows you to create uh, arbitrary systems for achieving some kind of value that don't seem to have any relationship or have a marginal relationship at best to, to, to whatever database that happens to be. So let's talk about it too. Steemit. Steemit is a fun project. It's the Reddit of cryptocurrency and so much more. And then there's Sandpit. Sandpit is the Bloomberg of cryptocurrency. If anybody knows Bloomberg, but also so much more. Okay, so Reddit is essentially a social discovery and interaction platform. You participate in these communities, reward one another socially with upvotes, comments, occasionally if you're cool, you get rid of gold. Yeah. So the incentives to participate are non-monetary. You most of the time, unless you can, you know, 
swing some kind of business into there. Most of the time, you're just there for the social aspect, for the recognition, and to share information with one another. And the value proposition of Steam is to say, what if you could take all of that, that function, distribute the cost of supporting that, that infrastructure under the network, and supercharge the incentives to create content and upvote with money? So what if you could make Reddit upvotes equal money? Wow, that would be cool, wouldn't it? And that's Steam.com. So that's the, the hope that Steam would like to be. Steam is still in beta, but it supercharges social and monetary benefits. It's back, it, Steam is actually backed by its own blockchain, and it's all built around rewarding content and rewarding curation. Basically, the idea is you have a pseudo-centralized, or partially decentralized group of miners who secure the network and perform the network functions. And then the actual distribution of rewards the distribution of value on the Steam blockchain, which is generated via inflation, is done according to activity from accounts on the network. So people have weighted stakes depending on how much you already have. Your vote means more. And the more people vote on certain content, the more rewards it receives. Grant. So can I just uh, code a, a bot and uh, Absolutely. put it to work? And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And people do. Bots are big on Steam. Not that they do all that much, they just automate the voting for you. Mm -hmm. But they do something. What's your question? Yeah, so I, I went on Steam and I, something I found weird was like, I felt like people were like complimenting others just to get recognition. It, it felt fake at a point. I don't know if you know you felt that or you know what I mean. And how you a bit like Black Mirror episode. That was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry because I didn't work there, but that's really, you know, true. That's why I felt <laughs> So let's, uh, I'll specify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one thing, the Steam community is unusual because a lot of that is actually sincerity. And it's yeah. unusual because somehow this, this is really interesting. It's the incentive structure of the Steam. It switches something in your mind once you, you know, you get your first post and you get paid 200 bucks on Steam for it. Yeah. It changes your relationship to the community and to social media. So. And this happens to pretty much everybody who hits the platform. Uh, once you make a big payday of some kind, your relationship to social media tends to change. Okay? So there is a, a really an unusual vibe. But you haven't seen the flame wars that go on there too. Just like Reddit, it uh, is natural for people to compete. And because there is an intent, a monetary incentive to do so, the flame wars can get pretty intense. As the platform grows, we're going to see it become increasingly contentious, and the idea of like meme wars on the internet, well, Steam is going to post all of those. It's going to be like 4chan back on money. <laughs> but, uh, but it'll also be cool, right? They'll, they'll be, you'll be able to create strong incentives for people to create content on the network. So if you were watching last week, we had that chain EDD post, so a chain UX, UI for the Steam blockchain. What did they get? Like 2,200 bucks of Steam? 2,000 dollars worth of Steam? So that's going back up, and, and it's been higher previously, and it's been lower previously. So the values depend on a lot of things. But there's something, your, your nature to these kinds of platforms changes when you interact with this incentive structure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what's the difference between GitHub and Stack Overflow? Why don't you have an incentive? Everybody posts a lot of things online? That is the, so, the hope and, and dream of Steam. Steam is the back end blockchain behind Steam.com. There are already applications for something that's a lot like Instagram, there's a Steam Twitter kind of in development, there's a Steam Forum that's in development, there's a, a Steam Dig relative to the Polish market called Streamy that's in development, and these are all separate teams, this is not Steam that incorporated, these are different people building their own assets on the blockchain. It is expected that there will be a Steam Quora, a Steam uh, SAP overflow, I don't know if there will be a Steam GitHub. But the point is we put all stuff there. Uh, sure. The recognition for the code and repos we have there is already has enough value, sure. so we don't get any currency or blockchain underneath. That's, the that's true, yeah. on Git, For us, GitHub is probably the most well known. So, what do you think would happen if you know you answer a question on say Quora or Stack Overflow, and you know you got all that recognition, you got like 50 upvotes, man, people love you, it's great. And then what happens? If you got all that recognition, you're helping people, and you got 50 upvotes, and they give you 500 bucks. Not working. <laughs> your relationship to these, to these it, it changes your relationship to the entire platform and to the community involved. 
because now it becomes a source of stuff. So now you can quantify the value. Make no mistake, this kind of money is being earned on all these social media platforms. It's just you're not getting it. Yeah. Okay? So obviously, you know, Facebook is a good example. They're monetizing you and to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. So you say, oh, well, it's good enough. And you're absolutely true. That's why these, these, these media exist. And Reddit is a, you know, a great platform. I love Reddit personally. But would I, rather get, would I rather be making the billions of dollars that Reddit makes or should be making? You know, what, what would happen there? And then would I use Reddit more if I was participating in the network and getting the rewards of that? It's just because reputation doesn't have to have any kind of funnels. And it's pretty much, uh, GitHub is a great example. For instance, I'm looking at jobs. They probably just go there and see who has the best repos. And that is the, the specific value because there's a place so people can show their skills. They don't. Yes. And it's on the value of uh, getting in a great place to work, probably it's much more than 15 bucks of Bitcoin. So this is, the value doesn't, this is going back to the question of value and if it has to be underlined sure. on a blockchain structure, because. Sure, and the answer is it doesn't, of course. If you had a social media like Reddit, the Steam and Reddit are the best, probably the comparisons at the moment. But if you had a social media like Reddit that was paying its contributors that was distributing the monetary value of the network to them, you would have something perhaps not as efficient as Steam. It would probably have a lot higher cost, but you would see some of that kind of value in the system. And Reddit did try to do this earlier on. They did try to incorporate Bitcoin. That didn't work out at all, but uh, they thought about it. But at the moment, we haven't seen any networks successfully do this. Only Steam it. And what we see is the entire Relate. Again, it, it's hard to describe the change in psychology that overtakes you once you start getting money for your social media, or the appearance of money, of value of any kind. It's just, it reworks your psychology. It's just what it does. And you could say, well, you know, the GitHub recognition is enough. It doesn't matter, because if you do 10 repos, and on every one you get 100, 200, 1,000, 10,000 dollars, there's that Last year, there was that woman who did some parasite on the and she got 36 grand of steam. It was ridiculous. Uh, dark days. <laughs> but uh, it, it changes the nature of your interaction with the platform, and it changes the viability and the value proposition of that platform. So assuming something like Steam can, can kickstart, and this is what obviously we're working on, kickstarting. But, but is it Steam a website? Steam it is or, a website. Or is, or is steam is a blockchain. Right, but the second, th I mean, if I'm the owner of Medium, could I just decide to use your technology? Sure, we love that. <laughs> but we, we, I mean, it's not like we haven't encouraged, we encourage other businesses to use Steam, but we're working on making that possible. But aren't you competing against them at the same time with the, the, the website? As a website, yes. But the funny thing is, yes, we might be competing for the inflation, which of course is how Steam is created, but we all benefit by the increase in value of the blockchain. And that increase in value presumably comes from its use or the supply and the demand for it. So if there's more demand for Steam, if there's more use on it, the rough proxy for that is how many people are interacting with the currency. If Medium adopts Steam tomorrow, Steam's going to pump. And it'll be beautiful, and no one will care about competition because it won't be about that. I'm going to buy some Steam cards. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so what can you do with the reward? So what do you do? Basically, with Steam or Steam Power, you have influence over the network. So the direct consequence is that you can influence what content is curated and how value and rewards are distributed. In the future, there will probably be demand on the advertising side, but that information is not been made public. I, I, I get it. I mean, if I earn like 100 Steam value, sure. I need to somebody else to, to trust that to exchange for any other value. Yes. It's like a commission, like money. Yes. Just so, like anything. So it again, the obstacle is trust again. And because you can have a lot of a value of something, but if nobody cares, yeah. it's nothing. That's right. You so how you can sell it on an exchange. Oh, is it is accepted accepted in some market yes. yeah. already. How much is Steam worth on Twitter market cap? I'm with you. Uh, 0 0.00, I don't know, I don't know. The net market cap right now, someone checks me, so I don't have to say that a lot. Okay. It was 86 cents, the market cap is 
So it's worth two market two hundred million. Twenty million dollars. Twenty million dollars. So why use steam? Well, yeah. the volume there will show a great deal of demand for it. Whether that demand reflects actual use of the product or, or strictly speculation is, is a completely separate thing. Uh, for some degree, it's impossible to know. We can never guarantee that these products will be a success. Steemit is a black mirror project, okay? <laughs> All of these blockchains are black mirror project. Get used to it, because we're building your future, and you know, either you're with us or you're with us, it doesn't really matter. We're just gonna make a better, more efficient future, and you're gonna have to come along. So, so the, going back to the question of bots, uh, sure. how do you control people from changing the system? So the, the amount of power and voting duration you have on Steam depends on your Steam power. Okay. Kind of vested currency, basically. A vested token. So it doesn't really matter how many bots you have making comments or, or doing this or that, because their power, their influence, is directly relative to the state. And the more they vote, the, the power of that state diminishes until it returns after 24 hours. If you lots of bots that create uh, relevant contents, that's... Sure, but it won't rank. But the thing is, if you have one in an exchange and, and transfer it to some bots mm -hmm. and use that... Sure. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want. That is going to be more relevant than the no. bots that the bots have. Mm -hmm. No. So these were problems from the very beginning. How do you deal with people who are basically trying to vote a lot? And the answer is, your, your, the weight of your vote is, is not continuous. It's not the same in all time periods. For example, if I vote once today, I think, like, uh, I'll send a post up a few dollars, but if I vote 10 times, every following time I vote, the value of my vote gets goes down. Okay. What if everybody builds bots, and some build bots to build content, and other bots to vote? Doesn't it turn sure. into a, a, a sure. paid HFT exchange? So the, one of the fascinating things and one of the central innovations of Steam is that it incentivizes human creation. Yeah. Human curation. So when, if I go looking at a post and I upload it, I am curating, but I'm also getting a stake in that post. If it goes up really high, I get a small amount of the reward. And there are hundreds and thousands of people every day who are curating these but posts. But you were doing your bot is gaming the system, just, just like a, a traditional exchange used to be uh, people you know, buying and selling stock, and now you have machines trading stock between themselves, and the rules along the way have, have modified themselves naturally, so they fit the current situation of machines interacting with machines. Sure. Does that, uh, can't uh, that happen also? In this case, if okay, if you incentivize humans, but if the human, if the bot is trying to get maximum reward, eventually, if you have many bots, they will converge into into a interaction that maximizes reward for you know, sure. people. Sure, there are attack bots. vectors uh, from bots, but so far they've been pretty minor. Uh, we can count the ones that are problematic on our fingers and for, for a variety of reasons are not feasible. But we should see more over time and, and Steam is, the Steam blockchain is constantly being developed specifically to deal with these game, these potential problems. Right? So they, we cannot stop there being attack vectors if we want to have these kinds of systems just because if there's you know two hundred million dollars there, who's not going to want to game that system? You just can't stop it. But it, it's a constant vigilance, a constant policing that's going on. Every blockchain is like this to some degree. We are all engaged in a constant battle to secure the network the best we can. Do we have any more questions about Steemit? Sure. I verification. How are you making sure that it's actually a person and not a bot? Because sign. Uh, guys on Coinbase, they have things about e looking to different sides of pixel base, so it's kind of really off record because of big transit as well. So the question is how you are doing the uh, ID verification, because on Coinbase is sending sure. a photo, biometrics and all these things, and how you are keeping records going back sure. about the database of every user so you can track what they have been doing. So for starters, we, uh, Steemit Inc. <coughs> has no requirement to do any of that. This is not money. There's no KYC. There's no AML. This is an arbitrary token on a network that Steam does not control. Whereas the Steam blockchain exists independently of Steam. So there's no need for KYC and there's no need for AML. 
And most blockchain networks are like this. These are not financial assets. Okay? It's an, if you said two minutes ago it's a 200 million, Sure. You are you are playing the rule of it's not an asset, it has value. It's not an asset. That's that's yeah. That's, that's basically what's going on, and that's that's the entire blockchain space right now. And but it's annoying and problematic, and we will have regulation that comes in deal with that. Hopefully, we will classify most of these blockchain tokens as assets and be done with it. But right now, it is no continuing in a way that we don't have such regulation in place, and that nobody understands what we're dealing with. But you want to have the thing is going back. You want to be sure you have people, real persons, and not bots. Otherwise, everyone going to India yes. hire a bunch of. Them. But that's that's a completely different problem. So one is you have the problem of bots sign up, okay? or have, or or and two people. is you have the problem of AML. Okay, KYC AML is not a project for Steam, and it will never be a project. Crypto. I'm saying, in order to not have bots, you have to have compli compliance or methods to know it's a person ah. behind the computer. So this was the qu previous question: how you know it's a bot and not a, a, a person and not a bot? Yes. And the question is, is, if you're looking on the internet, how you are handling these things? Yeah. So this is a problem that we feel, especially at, at Steam, because whenever a new account signs up to Steam. We give them a small amount of steam. We have to essentially give them money so that they can just get on the network. So there's also an incentive to take that money for free by arbitrarily creating accounts. So we have had to deal with this in a very uh, obtuse manner. We have to have a, a layered onboarding process that has a lot, a lot of steps to go through. You have a phone sign up. You have an email verification. Uh, we we look at you. There's, we even do some kind of manual detection. Uh, as, this, as the network grows, we can't do any manual detection, but we're, we are doing that to make sure that nobody is gaming it. We can minimize the, the amount of abuse, but we basically make sure that people aren't intentionally abusing the sign-up process. Okay. And at the moment, most of that is it's just a mix of automatic stuff and manual stuff and, and steps. And the, the Steam and sign-up process at the moment is not smooth. <coughs> it is not smooth. We are working on it as quick as they can, but. It's just a requirement with, when dealing with these kinds of systems. We're going to give people, you know, money for signing up to social media, and we got to secure that. What can we do? How many users do you have? Uh, I think there's like depends how you measure users. There's I think these days there's several thousand between several high hundreds and low thousands active on the site at any one time. There's like two hundred thousand accounts or something. So it's still a very much in its early phase. Not at all viral. This is all just in its in its early phase, and yet it has the uh, insane valuation that it does. Yeah. Like just so we're clear, we're going to bring up the Black Mirror example again. We're in Black Mirror right now uh, in terms of the, the crypto and blockchain space. We deal with this on a daily basis. So expect to see more of this just weird stuff popping out of here. Like purple. Valuation. <laughs> it's not going to take anything. Ripple is not even a blockchain, but whatever. I like it. Well, it's yeah. because just a bunch of rich people put money in. That's why that's no. Ripple was was Ripple was originally designed to do something very different from what it does now. And what it does now is it serves as a, a transfer mechanism for banks. No. But they do not need Ripple in any sizable amount for them to make use of the system. So you might have like literally. I don't know, a few bucks, a few tens of bucks, a few hundreds of bucks of Ripple to handle your, your transaction needs using the Ripple system for a year. And the current market capitalization is 12, 12 billion. There's never been a, there's, it's impossible for that demand to, it, this is to the best of my knowledge, perhaps I don't know Ripple best, but to the best of my knowledge, it does not seem to me like there would ever be enough demand to justify that kind of valuation for the project. Not to mention that uh, the whole amazing part about it is, is the decentralized settlement uh, that makes Ripple feasible. They'll just make their own system, or they'll use Enterprise Ethereum, or they'll just do something else, put it all on Hyperledger, and then the cost will go from like 10 bucks a year to cents a year. It's, yeah, but is it's the a core limited? limited? Is, it, is it limited or does yeah, it matter? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter because it's it just it's well into the stratosphere. It's not it's it's to the point of insanity. It's tulip mania. Yeah. That's where Ripple is tulip mania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be warned. <laughs> Stop loss limit. Yeah, yeah, stop loss limit. <laughs> <laughs> Some people may not know what to look at it is. I think uh, March explained me like, uh, last week, so. Okay, <laughs> so. Do you guys want to know what Tulip Mania is? Or do you not care? We care. I think it's an awesome story. We care. We care. Okay, okay. So, 
What, I think it was in the 1700s, 1800s, there was a giant speculative craze in the Netherlands. And this is an amazing time for the Dutch, because everybody was speculating over tulips. <laughs> tulips, that's right, flowers. And people were spending, first, the interest of flowers, they came to the Netherlands, and they were like, wow, this flower is amazing, I'd like to buy some. And next thing you know, people started looking at it and saying, this is the most beautiful flower I've ever seen. Perhaps if I hold on to this, I can sell this flower for dramatically more money later on. And so they started doing that, and it caught a wave. Everybody started buying tulips, and the price of tulips started going higher and higher and higher. People were, were selling mansions to buy a single tulip, naming their tulips, going to their tulip auctions. <laughs> oh, famous tulip, my favorite one of all the pictures I had seen was called the Viceroy. Uh, and ultimately, they would find out as they get to the peak of this bubble, as everybody is buying and selling tulips, that there isn't actually demand for tulips that people will not pay an army's worth of money to buy your flower. And your flower also dies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you are, literally, you and your guys have got all this tulip, and everybody realizes, as people start to flood the market with, with, with tulips for sale at increasingly lower prices, that the flowers you are holding and safeguarding in your, your tulip vault are, are not wanted anymore. And so an immense amount of wealth is created, or expropriated, as the people who got in early to sell their tulips make bank, and then everybody is left as a bag holder at the end with their worthless tulips. And some random Dutch people with you know, buckets of money <laughs> walking away without the flowers. They sold flowers and got riches. But so that, this is the, the problem of, of uncontrolled speculation. And this is what we are seeing to some degree in crypto right now. There are corrective mechanisms in the blockchain space, and I'm not a financial advisor, so you take it it's all a grain of salt. But there is a problem of valuation in the blockchain space. Uh, and a good example could be Ethereum. Ethereum is a fascinating project, $9 billion market cap, I think. But what's the actual demand for the service? Marginal at best. If this was a private startup, it would probably be worth a few hundred million dollars. Ripple is another good example. Even though there is billions of dollars worth of money flowing through Ripple, they aren't taking that amount of profit. Their valuation is insane. There's no connection to business. Are we going to talk about Gnosis ICO now? Oh, let's not. <laughs> but we could go on and on. The point is, tulip mania, speculative fever is dangerous, and, and be warned, uh, this is there's uncontrolled hype. But let's continue, and we can return at the end if we want to talk about tulips. <laughs> Okay, and this actually leads right into another project I'm working on, which is Sandman. Uh, who here is familiar with Bloomberg, Bloomberg's business model? Okay, so Bloomberg is one of the coolest businesses I feel around. It is in the business of financial information and data feeds. Almost all the money comes from the Bloomberg terminal sales. Uh, and basically what they do is they just package a bunch of data feeds, and they sell it for $20,000 a pop, and they're not allowed to say no, or you're uncool at Wall Street. And it's a great business, and they, they a very valuable product, and they're worth, I don't know, how many tens, maybe a hundred billion dollars now. Now, let's do a report. Let's, let's, So what is Sandman doing? Well, Sandman sees two problems in the space. One, in crypto, there are no data feeds. You trade on extremely limited information because the market is so volatile and there's such a lack of liquidity. Uh, it's just extremely risky, and you can't mitigate your risk by any means. So what it does is it says, well, okay, not only can we turn the model, uh, the middleman model on its head by creating a platform, a community-owned platform for these data feeds with community benefits, but it also says, how about we create the data too? And we distribute the rewards of that data too. So we'll create the incentive system to reward people for contributing and creating value and sentiment-based data, sentiment being cloud and motion, precisely the things that are ailing the crypto space now, which is hype and fud, fear, uncertainty, doubt. Excitement and depression. Chosen by good to buy and good to sell. So, Sandman takes this traditional model with Bloomberg, you know, a very similar one, and says, let's open this up and then let's distribute to the boards of the people who create the data, either the data feeds or the network participants who are participating in the creation of data for those feeds. Just another example, and you can see here they don't have the private blockchain, it's going to be built on Ethereum. It seems loosely related, but this entire mechanism, this entire model is only made really feasible and sustainable thanks to decentralized settlement, thanks to the blockchain. Thanks to you, your ability to create arbitrary rule sets and then put them on a computer on a service that nobody owns. 
For example, uh, again, it's all about incentive systems. Incentive systems are the real application of blockchains as businesses. We have decentralized data storage. So of course we have storage. We have SIA, Filecoin, Mainsafe. All different projects, Mainsafe isn't really a blockchain, but it is an incentive system. Okay? Decentralized computing. Of course, this is a very value proposition. We have IEX in their hypothetical decentralized service. We have Golo with their, I think they're doing high resolution image processing right now. And then we have SOMM, which will maybe come along, we'll see if those Russians do a good job, we don't know. Uh, and of course we have smart contracts, the one everybody thinks blockchains are about, but really aren't. Smart contracts are just, of course, uh, you, when you put your processes and your systems onto the blockchain so that you can't necessarily control it, so that it becomes transparent, so that anybody can see how this works. You're just specifying the rule set in advance. And there's a bunch of systems that can do that. We have Ethereum, we have Byteball, which is a day, which is limited smart contracts. We have Ardor and NXT, which is pre-built smart contracts called smart transactions to make sure nobody screws up the coding, a la the DAO. And then we have Lisp, which is basically a, a Ethereum being implemented on JavaScript. Except what is funny. But, uh, and there's, there's many, many, many more. Incentive structures are the key part and without a decentralized, transparent blockchain, incentive structures are simply not that trustworthy. They lose a lot of their benefits. The decentralization confers benefits because of trust. It doesn't mean they aren't useful without it. Smart contracts or automated business processes are useful regardless of whether they're centralized or decentralized. But the decentralization mechanism makes them more trustworthy because you know that the other guy who designed the process for you isn't simply going to change it arbitrarily. Innovations everywhere. There's so much more we didn't talk about. Again, decentralizing financial settlement, super cool. Revolutionizing auditing. Blockchains are going to be huge for, for audits of all kind. We're really excited to see the work there. Revolutionizing state and corporate governance. This goes for governance in general. A lot of the really innovative governance work is happening in the crypto and blockchain space because more than anybody else we need it. It's really hard to organize and lead and govern random anonymous people on the internet. That's a serious problem. So we are building a lot of that tech for ourselves. And it's going to all filter into the real world, so to speak. One good example today was, of course, Aragon. Aragon did their crowd sale today. That's Luis Quende in Barcelona and Jorge Espiardo in Madrid. 26 million. Fuck, are you serious? Yeah. Just, just ended. Did it end? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, man, the FOMO. Um, <laughs> FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. Uh, this is leading, this is not going to end well, but. Um, <laughs> but it is what it is, and it's up to the rest of us to be responsible because this technology is going to introduce. Uh, cat yeah, sorry, 23 million. 23 million. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm happy they lower the cap. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, up to them. Where were we? Yeah, Aragon is doing a decentralized jurisdiction. For, for the governance of institutions and teams and pseudo corporations of all kinds, simply over the internet, via whatever standard of mechanism they have. Colony is the same. Imagine if you could create your corporation and you have all the means of, of governing it and working together with uh, potentially infinite, infinitely large amount of people. I have one application, of course, is voting. We can make the entire process of voting transparent and, and significantly harder to gain than it currently is. If anybody's familiar with electronic voting as it is now, the security is a joke. Yeah. So we're just going to see this start to permeate everywhere. But that's going to take some time. Today I focused on trust and incentive structures because that's what I think is the most amazing innovation. Not everybody is going to agree with me, but I'm certain they're wrong. Now, there's really an unknowable number of new business models that's going to come out of this. I'm not going to predict it all for you. People are just going to start making weird stuff, and some of it's going to work, and some of it's going to fail. And half the projects you see on the list today are probably not going to be around in two years. And you're going to see maybe 10% of the projects that exist today are around in five or 10 years. Who knows? We, we've opened up Pandora's box, and it's going to lead to some really cool stuff, but we don't know. And no one knows how far these things will go. We just know that they will go far. Okay, take away. Blockchain incentive structures are going to transform the world and they'll bring new business models to life. 
So be thinking, think, 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 because there is a, you know, a huge gold mine, a huge opportunity to build new business models that simply weren't possible five or 10 years ago. Uh, that exists now. Thanks for listening. You are welcome to ask me questions. Anybody have questions? I'll try my best. Just a personal one. You're using Proton Mail and you are uh, talking about transparency. It's quite interesting uh, you're using yes. The, yes. the whole thing. Uh, one thing that you didn't mention, I think it would be worthwhile, it's on property rights and music rights. Yes. In, because I think, uh, namely in uh, countries like Africa, there's a lot of problems with records and people don't trust yes. and that. So I think just to note that there's a lot of things and music as well. In, yeah, so I think the time record keeping is important. Blockchains suddenly have a lot of utility. So we've also seen some blockchain examples for land registries that happened in the Canada with the tracking team. There's a few other African countries and Western countries uh, who are playing with it. It's the copyrights of music and gaming and the gaming industry. They are using a lot of blockchain in London as well because... People are talking about it, but that hasn't really come about yet. Media chain got bought by Spotify recently. Yeah. Spotify is something that... Well, they just, they didn't build it, they just bought it. So they're building it. But now. how can you buy a that's weird, how can you buy a blockchain? That well, you can't buy a blockchain, but you can buy the corporation that's building the technology. Oh, the community or yeah. Yeah, okay. And you can also get privileged access to the team that way. So, you know, maybe something like I, I don't think Steam would ever allow itself to be bought out, but hypothetically, someone like Facebook could say, Hey guys, you know, you're super cool, how about you have a billion or two billion dollars and we'll buy you out? And we can't destroy your system. The system already exists, but we'll be able to, you know, we'll gain access to the world to experts who are building that big kind of Just to get back to my question in the beginning, so uh, about the Ethereum coin itself. Sure. If you build a project on Ethereum, how, so when you create an app, is the coin created? How, how does that work? Do you know? So what Ethereum allows is decentralized computing, right? Yeah. And one of the consequences of that is that you can build on the system and you can give it its own rules so it can act as its own currency de facto or its own token. It's not really correct to call these things currencies. Yeah. So that's not what they are, they're tokens. But if people value them or not, they value the Warhammer gold. Or Warcraft gold rather. That revealed my nerve there. But uh, you can basically program the rules into that you wish. Sandwich system will be programmed on Ethereum. A whole bunch of other tokens are Gnosis, Aragon, MakerDAO. I mean, the list is so long. No, Steam is based on its own blockchain. Uh, it has unusual characteristics. It was necessary for social media. It does like 33,000 33, transactions per second, uh, three second block times. You need, Ethereum is just far too slow. Ethereum is not a fast blockchain. It's, it's quite slow. It's faster than Bitcoin, but everything is faster than Bitcoin these days. So, uh, so, so if, if I have a Ethereum, I can sell it for money, or I can go to the system and do what with it? If you have Ethereum, you can use it to pay other people who want others for computing power. In this case, it's basically a transaction fee. And it's simplest explanation. Okay, I can pay people on blockchain to build me stuff. You can pay them to, to essentially do computation for you according to your set rules. I think I have stuff will be on that, by the way. The next talk? Yeah. That's going to be the next talk. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so don't let me spoil it. I'm not <laughs> sure. Right. Is sentiment running its own blockchain with the Ethereum blockchain? Or do you run on the Ethereum blockchain itself? So, it's, I mean, I, I don't know too much about running blockchains on Ethereum. It's not really my specialty. Yeah, I actually came out of the NXP and Hardware community before I came to the Ethereum community, and now in all these other communities. Uh, it's just crypto is weird like that. But I think we're just going to build, with, with Sandpoint, and with a lot of these projects, we actually want to minimize the, fun the decentralized functions, because decentralization creates a, a variety of problems for efficiency. For example, if you want to move data feeds through the system, and these data feeds consume a lot of bandwidth, you simply, it, it's just not feasible to, to work them through any of these decentralized systems. We should just put it in a data center and feed the data, and, and that's what's required for that service. So, <coughs> Components of it are being built on it, just like components of a lot of projects are, but not everything is necessarily built on a different blockchain. Although there's a couple of off, off chain technologies being yeah. built to uh, solve some, some of those problems, like. like uh, Shaping it right in the Lightning Network? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, why? I mean, 
there are, there are benefits to doing that, but depending on the service, it might just be better to do expensive. No, sure, sure, right? sure. I'm just saying, for, because we were talking about the speed of transactions, for instance, sure. and, and that can change in the future. That's, that's very true. One thing for everyone to keep in mind is just because decentralization is, is hyped and is buzzed right now, it doesn't, it's a conditional good. So there's a lot of cases, it, it, for the last century, it's been centralization always has an advantage. So we're seeing a sudden rebirth where now it becomes apparent that there are advantages to decentralization for some business models in some cases, but it is a conditional good and still useless for a lot of things. For example, uh, decentralized exchanges, they, they, they sound great and they seem super cool and they're so fun to use. The problem is you realize you have to pay a transaction fee for you know, placing a put order or limit order and it's not fast, and you can't use bots, and there's all these problems. And this is because once you add the layer of decentralization and the consensus required, or basically the time and energy that's consumed there, you just kill certain business models that depend on scale, that depend on speed, that depend on this or that or the other thing. So it's not good for everything, but it is good for a lot of things, and we should all be thinking about that so that we can make it good for us too. Okay, cool. Anything else? Are we good to go? Sure. Ask the question. Is it a question? a nonsense question, but I need to raise it. Is there any agency rating the cryptocurrency space? Like you have agencies rating banks and countries? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> there, is a, there are people in the community, like for sentiment, what we were, we were originally uh, crypto. Crypto interested people. I, some, some of us were traders, I'm a marketer, some other people are investors. It, it varied, and we all came together to judge projects collectively. And there's a variety of teams that have come together to do this. That, you know, together look at projects and say, you're shit, you're a scam, you're real, we should support you. You produce some kind of valuable function, you're engaged in an ethical behavior, but there's no institutional power. Good. So you are building the rules of evaluation. We police ourselves. But that doesn't necessarily work. Okay, this is it is the nature of a wild west. This is what it all is. The next wild west, the internet. Yeah. We make our own rules. 